long day, but a really, really interesting day. I'm so pleased to have heard the stories of so many people who have left Scientology, and it gives me and my family hope. I'm here talking on behalf of my family, but I'd like to say my brother is here, my sister is here, my husband, my son and my daughter, and all other family members who would love to be here as well. Not everyone can be here, but it's nice to be here to represent them today and to talk about it. I'd like to start by reading to you a statement issued by my family to the press in the early summer of 1994. It was a statement of the Phelan family. Our brother Tony has been involved with Scientology for the past six years. In the beginning, we were unaware of what we now view as the sinister nature of the organization. But we did notice many changes in our brother's outlook and personality, as well as an adverse effect on his relationship with us. This led us into investing Scientology as a philosophy and as an organization. In our opinion, Tony's membership of this organization is not voluntary. We believe it is as a result of coercive and destructive pseudo-scientific processes based on deception, dependency, and fear. Further, the organization, we believe, is exerting mind control techniques on our brother to the extent of influencing him not to review fully the information we have discovered. We have exhausted our efforts to get Tony to understand our concerns. And it is our belief that up to now, all of our communication with our brother has been orchestrated by their internal security department. In our opinion, this department specializes in coercive tactics and considers that lying, cheating, stealing or destroying any opposition to their doctrines is acceptable in order to protect their interests. This has only reinforced our concern for our brother's safety and well-being. We are determined to secure the release of our brother and shall continue our campaign until Scientology ceases to exert its influence on him. That was 18 years ago. Yeah. And every word in that, as I listen today, it's exactly what has happened to him. I don't think we need to change the statement today. It's as it is. But it is sad that 18 years later, he has not got any contact with his family and we are disconnected from him. Some of you know the background, but just to briefly go through it, my mother died quite suddenly in 1988. At the time, Tony was working for an electronics computer firm based here in Dublin, but he had been sent on a training course over to California. He was spending six months over there. So when my mother came ill and died quite suddenly, he got home just before she died, but didn't really get a chance to talk to her. Following the funeral, he didn't really communicate much with any member of the family. We, he was still in shock, as we all were. But he returned to the States very shortly afterwards. And through talking to people he shared apartment with, later on we discovered what happened. He, letters or notifications or leaflets came in the door advertising Dianetics. And he was at such a vulnerable time in his life. While he was with colleagues from Ireland, he was separated from his family and friends at a very difficult time in his life. And that's what drew him into it. And to summarize everything else, at the time we had no idea what Dianetics was. When he came home, he told us he was doing these personality courses and that he found them really helpful. And of course, we thought, he's just back from America. What's Dianetics? It's fine. We won't worry about it. So over the next year or two, while we knew he was doing these courses here in Dublin, and we did notice some changes taking place in his personality, we weren't overly concerned. First time when we started getting concerned was around the end of 91, beginning of 92, one of his old mates from work sent us a copy of a Time magazine article. And the Time magazine article was, and I'm sure a lot of you know of it, The Thriving Cult of Greed and Power. And it stated summary that it ruined lives, lost futures. Scientology poses as a religion, but is really a ruthless global scam. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing, oh my God, we really kind of, we started looking at it, he refused to read that article. When we started talking to him and saying, what is this? talk to us, he refused to read the article. Various members of the family went off and did various research, and my older brother PJ would have met up with Mike Gard at the time. Mike, as you all know, was involved with Dialogue Ireland. Mike gave us a lot of information about Scientology at that time. My other brother John spoke to Bonnie Woods and John Atak, got information from them. 
we did various research. I'd like to give you some quotes of some of the information we had. A justice lately ruling on a child custody case in London in July 1984 stated, Scientology is both morally and socially obnoxious. It is corrupt, sinister and dangerous. It is corrupt because it is based on lies and deceit. It is sinister because it indulges in infamous practices. It is dangerous because it is out to capture people and indoctrinate and brainwash them. A report on the Board of Inquiry into Scientology for the state of Victoria, Australia in 1965. Scientology is evil. Its techniques are evil. Its practice is a serious threat to the community, medically, morally, and socially. And one more. Californian Supreme Court Judge Breckenridge in a 1984 decision when he was describing the founder of Scientology, Mr. L. Ron Hubbard, the evidence portrays a man who has been virtually a pathological liar when it comes to his history, background, and achievements. The writings and documents and evidence additionally <coughs> reflect his egoism, greed, avarice, lust for power and vindictiveness, and aggressiveness against persons perceived by him to be disloyal or hostile. That and all the other information we had about Scientology, we tried to get Tony to read, and he would not read it, and he would not listen to us. He, this was kind of, like, and I don't have exact dates, we're talking here between 92 and say early 94. We worked a lot privately within the family to try and communicate with him. He went to do courses in St. Hill and in East Grimstead in England. My brother John was living over there at the time. He stayed with John for a while, but when John tried to help exit him through information he had got from John Atek and Bonnie Woods, he stopped going to stay with John. He went and stayed in a B&B, &B, et cetera. And he started at that stage disconnecting from us. The, kind of the final straw, I suppose, came for Sen when he took early redundancy. I'm not 100% sure of the timeline on this, but I think it was around 93. And he would have got a fairly big lump sum of money from his company. And he told us he was going to do a full-time course for the next 12 months in St. Hill with the intention of becoming a full-time auditor. So all our attempts in a private way of trying to get him out just weren't working. So at that stage, we decided it's time to go public. So in 1994, early summer 1994, we did our first protest against Scientology. And it's at that time we produced that statement. And we did a, basically a protest outside the, our offices in Middle Abbey Street. And there was follow-up interviews with the media, etc., both here in Eng Ireland and in England, because John was working in England at the time, and he was interviewed by a number of English newspapers as well. We did everything we could at the time that we felt to try and get him out, and it just didn't work. So we... Then the next big kind of publicity we did was that we were invited to participate in the Late Late Show in 1995. And many of you who are involved in looking at Scientology will have seen that on YouTube. My other brother PG was in the panel, the rest of us were in the audience. Tony was there with his minder, as we liked to call the person who was with him. <coughs> and at the end of the Late Late Show, we approached Tony and said, will you talk to us on our own? The answer was no, and he just left. So we haven't actually had a proper conversation with Tony since then. This connection and then at that stage had taken place. He was not talking to us because he had been forced at that, prior to that to go on a course and he had to either learn how to handle his family or disconnect. Otherwise, he would not be allowed to continue up the bridge to total freedom. So he has disconnected from us. The last time we saw Tony was in 2002 when my dad died. And my dad was 86 when he died. And I'm proud to say that he fully supported us in our public campaign against Scientology. Like, he was too old himself to participate or to agree to be interviewed or get involved, but he was very much in favour of what we were doing. He felt he had lost his son. And he was very glad to see us. And he, I think, to this day, and I said he's dead 10 years now, I believe he would be very proud of what we're doing today, that we are continuing to fight to get back our brother and his son. So the next time we saw Tony was actually at his funeral. We knew at that stage that Tony had moved to America. We knew he was working in an, a computer company in Boston. We had no address. We had no contact details for him. Other than that, we knew the name of the company. So when my dad died, we rang him, and we rang the personnel department of that company because it was the only way to contact him. And we gave a message to the personnel department. At that stage, we had no idea if he'd turn up or not. He didn't arrive to the removal five minutes before the mass started that morning. He did turn up. 
we were all in the church at that stage. I introduced him to my children, one of whom hadn't even been born. Stephen is here today. He hadn't even been born that day. So we, I, I introduced him to the children. We asked him if he wanted to participate or say anything at the funeral. He said no. Uh, following the funeral, we went to a local pub where we had a meal served, etc. And one of his old schoolmates who was present on the day and was aware of our concerns kind of kept an eye on him during the day. He watched him quite carefully. He spent, he had a minder with him from Scientology. He spent a maximum of two minutes talking to practically everybody in the room. He smiled, he was pleasant, he was sociable, he looked like he was, you know, very much fitting in. But he had no conversation with any one person that lasted longer than two minutes. He didn't sit down to the meal because that would have meant he would have been cornered by one person. He had agreed that he would stay with his old schoolmate overnight and he said to him, I will talk to you in the morning. And we knew this, so we were hoping we might catch him in the morning. And in the middle of the night, when his school friend was up feeding his baby, he heard his front door slam. And that's the last we heard directly from Tony. He hasn't been in touch with any of us since. So disconnection has been complete over the last, as I said, since 2002. So it is hard to be here today. Like our family, to us, have suffered a bereavement. But we continue to have hope. That is the only thing that we can actually do. We have, over the years, met other family members of people who have been involved in Scientology. And I do wonder why they don't talk out. I know a lot of them are afraid of disconnection. But to my mind, Tony, as a Scientologist, was not my brother. He was somebody who was completely different. A lot of families are afraid of intimidation. And I am glad to say we have not actually experienced direct intimidation from a Scientology organization. So I would say to people out there, don't be afraid. If you have a family member in Scientology and you're worried about them, stand up, talk. The more of us who talk, the more of us who talk and, and express our concerns, the less likely it is that Scientology will get, get their hooks into anybody else. And, for those, and we have two reasons as a family why we continue to talk. One of them is that if we can even save one more family from the loss that we have suffered, then it is worth it. And I do know personally of somebody whose son had started into Scientology a couple of weeks before the Late Late Show started. And when they saw the Late Late Show, they talked to him and he stopped going. So that to me was a fantastic achievement. And I would like to think there are more people out there like that. And of course, there are other reasons is we do hope Tony will come out. And listening to the stories of some of the people who are here today who were in for over 20 years and have come out, we hope that Tony will come out. And by talking up, he will know that we have never forgotten him and that we will always continue to fight for him. I'd like to say a special word of thanks to Anonymous for the work that you do. So many of you... <laughs> so many of you have no direct contact with Scientology. You haven't had family members who have been involved, but you're willing to fight for us. And I do appreciate that to thank the people who have left Scientology and who have experienced intimidation and are willing to still stand up and be counted. I admire you so much and I thank you. My guard from Dialogue Ireland who has been beside us for the last 18 years in our fight and I do appreciate that because having somebody who can actually kind of help you is fantastic. The guys on the protest every, every once a month on a Saturday in Mid Abbey Street who helped to make a situation there sometimes lighthearted. It is great to be there. We're not all, I'm not always there. My husband, Dennis, I have to say, Dennis turns up, I'd say, every month and hasn't missed hardly any of the protests, so he has been a great support. And as I said, all my family members who do support, we will continue this fight, and we would hope one day that Tony will come out. Okay. <laughs>